Okay, well, good morning, everyone, or uh, whatever time zone you happen to be in. Good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> practically night in uh, Australia. Anyway, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Annabelle McIver, who will be giving the first talk of this uh, two hour long session at the meeting of the categorical, what is it called exactly? Categorical Workshop on Probability and Statistics, which is not happening in Ottawa, but happening by Zoom instead. Anyway, there you are. Go ahead, uh, Annabelle. Okay, thank you. So I'll just share my screen. And All right, so can everybody see that? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak at this workshop. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, quantitative information flow, which uh, I've been working on with my colleagues for several years now. And, um, and the reason that um, uh, it's, it's interesting from a categorical perspective, hopefully, is that uh, quite a lot of the key ideas that we have um, been working out can be modeled quite nice uh, using uh, category theory. And as we go um, as we go on understanding more and more, we find that category theory seems to be a really nice setting for capturing some of these uh, strange uh, sort of properties that we uh, discover. So uh, quantitative information flow, uh, just a few words about that. It's all about analyzing how confidential information can leak from programs as they uh, execute. So, um, uh, we have been looking at it a little bit differently from the way other people look at that um, because we look at it from a verification perspective. So we like to have a program or a system or something and we might want to prove that um, no, uh, that has uh, some confide confidential information and we might want to prove that no information at all leaks if by accident or we might want to prove that well We've noticed that a little bit is leaking, but we might want to show that um, in some adversarial scenario, the adversary can't actually use the information in a very useful way. So, um, as I said, we're looking at it from a verification perspective. And when you start doing that, you kind of want to use all of the, use, uh, the kinds of techniques that are very common in verification to apply to this. Um, problem two. So in particular, we really want to be able to reason um, in a compositional fashion. So that's the idea where if you have a complicated system or program or something which is made from components, you want to take properties of the components. And in this case, it would be information flow properties. And you want to kind of put those all together to be able to prove system wide uh, properties. Now, what happens when uh, you start doing that with quantitative information flow, it turns out very quickly, actually, you see that you can no longer reason about standalone secrets. You can't take a component and say, oh, it's just got these sorts of secrets or confidential information inside it. So let's prove a few properties about those things and then hope to um, be able to understand system wide things, because it turns out that you have to worry about whether the secrets in a component are actually correlated all, with all kinds of other things. So that's um, when we came upon this idea that actually we should really be talking about correlations as things that are worthwhile to study in their own right. So, uh, so that's, that's why we came up with this um, uh, looking at a category of correlations. Um, so when I, that's what I was going to talk about originally, but then when I sat down to start writing this talk, I realized that probably as to be a, uh, suggested, I should tell everyone a little bit more about the background first before telling them about some weird category. Um, so most of the talk is gonna be reasoning about information flow using monads. And then hopefully in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll be able to come back and talk a lot more about correlations. So very quickly, here is a very, um, well, it looks detailed, but it's actually quite brief, uh, an outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to be telling, uh, starting off just showing you a couple of simple problems for um, 
to illustrate um, information flow in sort of systems or programs. And then I will tell you about the uh, sort of foundational simple mathematical model for um, modeling information flow and information theoretic adversaries. Um, so that will, I'll be telling you about the channel model of information flow. And then um, I will uh, sort of start talking a little bit about how some basic category theory can be very usefully used to give an information flow aware semantics for a small programming language. And once I've done that, then I'll be able to hopefully tell you what this category of correlations is. All right, so here's a couple of information flow problems. So here's a very classic problem, which probably everyone's heard of, uh, called the secretary problem. So there are N applicants and one position. Each applicant is inf interviewed and then either offered the position immediately or told that um, they don't have the position. And uh, of course, the, in, the so this is a classic problem for reasoning about partial information. But as the interviewer interviews more people, the interviewer finds out more, at least about the relative ability level of the line of candidates um, uh, before him. And then uh, obviously the interviewer has to choose his moment and say, right, you've got the job. Um, so really what you want to do is you want to understand when that information that is gradually released to the interviewer actually becomes useful so that he can use it, say that he wants to uh, get the best candidate. Uh, so another one is uh, side channels. So here is a very tiny little program. So PW is a password. And for some reason in this program, um, it is decremented for a while. And uh, so there's this timing at attack that can be done with programs like this. So you imagine that PW is a piece of confidential information and maybe an adversary wants to find out what that password is. Um, and if the adversary has some very um, accurate measuring instruments, then uh, they could gather some information as the program is running and then at least find out what the initial value of the password is. Um, so this is, uh, you know, more re realistic, I guess, more useful example of where information flow uh, analysis uh, is actually used on programs in security. All right, so, uh, so now let's just have a look at some, uh, what those two uh, examples are actually showing us is, um, the sort of ingredients that are formalized in uh, when you do a quantitative information flow analysis. So obviously there has to be some secret or confidential information for the secretary uh, example. It was um, the ability level of the line of candidates for the little program. It was the password. Um, and then, then there's also this idea that there's an adversary or player or something like that who doesn't know the secret, but probably wants to find out what it uh, is so that they can do something with it to benefit them rather than the owner of the secret. Um, obviously, the adversary also has only imperfect information about a secret. However, there is also a mechanism which might leak some information about that secret, which then uh, the attacker might be able to use to find out what it is, or to find out some property of the secret, something like that. Um, so quantitative information flow takes all of those elements together and uh, tries to figure out whether the information that leaks can uh, actually be used usefully by the adversary who wants to do something. So, so here's uh, just um, getting a slightly more um, uh, so here's something get, getting slightly more um, uh, uh, so, so mathematical. So we have, uh, we'll, we'll use chi for the base type. Um, so for example, that could be the potential set of passwords. And then a secret uh, is a probability distribution over the base type. So we have to imagine that the adversary might have some prior knowledge 
about uh, the secret, and that is modeled by a probability distribution. So we're going to use pi for uh, notation for our secrets. So for example, if you want to model an adver adversary that doesn't know anything, you might just choose a uniform distribution for the um, prior. But of course, if you look up what's the most common password, you find out that it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you might want to uh, bias your pi towards these uh, sort of commonly used passwords. Um, and then the mechanism of, is, of course, the program, which we'll get to in a moment. So what we need to do, though, is um, measure the uh, uh, model, the adversary. And so when you think about an information theoretic adversary, um, you have to actually think about, well, what does the adversary want to do uh, and uh, and what the adversary is able to do? So we have this idea of a game function. So this G takes a set of actions which is available to the adversary. So those are those Ws. And again, which is this G W comma X um, gives a dollar amount which measures the actual gain that the adversary receives if, if he performs action W when the secret is actually X. So a very simple example of a gain function uh, is base vulnerability. So we take the, so this is where the, this model is an adversary that actually wants to guess the actual secret. So, um, so then we'd say the set of actions is the same as the set of base secrets because each one corresponds to the various guesses. The, uh, so for example, uh, the adversary would, ha would have all the possible passwords available and then uh, each guess would be, I guess, password one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or some other kind of thing. So BVX, uh, comma, X prime is therefore one if the adversary guesses that the password is X and the password really does turn out to be X. Uh, and otherwise, BV uh, would give uh, a reward of zero to the adversary. So then in definition two here, we can work out uh, that if for some prior knowledge pi of the adversary, um, uh, and uh, gain function G, we, the, we can calculate the average vulnerability for that secret. It's the maximum over all possible uh, actions that the adversary can take of the average gain uh, calculated with respect to G, W, X and prior pi. So BV pi, for example, then is the probability that the adversary can guess the value of the secret. So we can sort of plot this thing out on a little graph here, which is what I've uh, done just to illustrate. So uh, here, let's take a very secret scenario where we're just looking at a secret bit. So the base type has two values, A and B, and then there's two guesses uh, for this base vulnerability. Uh, so the adversary can guess A or guess B. So on the uh, left-hand side of the graph, so on the horizontal axis, sorry, the, it, it gives the probability that the secret really is A under uh, prior pi. So if, if the probability uh, that the secret uh, is A is less than a half, then the adversary would choose uh, to guess B because that's the more likely value. And so you see, um, if the probability that the secret is uh, greater than than a, that the secret is A is greater than a half, then the uh, adversary would guess A. So you get this sort of like V shape with uh, the minimum uh, uh, value of uh, vulnerability when the uh, secret is uniformly distributed between A and B. So now what happens when uh, information leaks through a mechanism? So, uh, so that would be, for example, if the adversary did this timing attack on that little program. So a mechanism is a stochastic channel. So uh, C in this definition. So it takes a secret uh, uh, chi and um, an observation Y and it gives a probability. So Y is a set of observations. So in the a uh, little timing example that would be that would be times for the program to terminate. So the value C X Y therefore is the probability that uh, Y is observed when the secret is X. So if we're given a if we have a prior, we can actually figure out a joint distribution of correlation therefore between the uh, secret the probability of the secret and 
correlated with the observations. So now there's um, an example of a channel for this uh, scenario where we just have a secret bit. Uh, so we have two rows here. So when the secret is A, there are two um, observations, Y1 and Y2. And um, if the secret is A, either Y1 or Y2 can be observed with probability half. But if the secret is B, then uh, only Y1 is ever observed and never Y2. So uh, in this little scenario, just going through to illustrate the uh, joint distribution, um, which is what happens when you combine the channel with the prior, um, let's have a uniform prior to see what happens. So uh, first of all, we um, form the joint distribution. So this is combining the prior with the uh, channel probabilities. So we get this joint distribution here, uh, which is illustrated. Um, so A and Y1 is a probability of quarter and so forth. And then what we do is we uh, basically do some reasoning that the adversary does. We do some Bayesian reasoning. So we can calculate the marginal probability that we actually, so taken, given the joint distribution, we can calculate the marginal probability of each of the observations. So the probability that Y1 is observed is therefore three quarters in this example, one quarter that uh, Y2 is observed. So those are the uh, sort of yellow highlighted probabilities in this diagram. And then with respect to each observation, we can, we can do the Bayesian update, and we can calculate the, um, uh, we can calculate the uh, posterior for each of those uh, possibilities. So uh, if Y1 is observed, then, uh, the, uh, then the adversary uh, changes his view using a Bayesian update for the value it is. Uh, the value that the secret is, so it's more likely to be B rather than A. But if Y2 is observed, uh, then the secret must have been uh, A. And so this gives a, a posterior probability distribution over the secret A or B. Now, uh, what the way that I have um, uh, highlighted these posteriors and marginals uh, just give a little bit of nice structure that we will use when we come to using the probability monad for um, modeling all of this. So this is really, you should think of this as a distribution of distributions, which is why we call it a hyper distribution. So there's like this outer distribution, which is the marginal, that's the probability of the observations. And for each observation, we have a posterior uh, probability. So we'll We'll see that um, structure preserved in the uh, sort of category theory that we, uh, we use later. So now what happens when information uh, leaks through a mechanism? Well, we can compute the average uh, posterior vulnerability, which is highlighted in the, this orange, uh, the yellow rectangles here. So this is, we actually compute the uh, vulnerability of each of the posteriors, and then we average it over the marginal. So um, in this diagram here, uh, I've put as black lines the original uh, uh, Bayes vulnerability. And so if we started in the middle with a prior vulnerability of uh, uniform, we would uh, be sitting with the Bayes vulnerability at a half. Um, after we push everything through the um, channel, we see that the blue posterior vulnerability is the blue star marked on the diagram and the red posterior is the red star marked on the diagram. And then the yellow is the weighted average of those two things according to the marginal. And that's where we get the yellow, uh, the yellow uh, average posterior afterwards. And so because that's, that uh, has gone up, it means that in this particular scenario, the uh, adversary has actually been able to use the um, uh, the information leaked to change his action to better his um, to, be to better his game. So this has been an actual useful leak for this particular adversary. So uh, just to uh, so that was very quick, but just to sum up the way of how we actually use this in a quantitative information flow analysis, we would. Um, 
compare the prior vulnerability to the posterior vulnerability. And if the posterior vulnerability is strictly greater, then we can say that the adversary has usefully changed his actions to, be, to better match uh, the value of the secret after the information has leaked. Um, so um, that's because the, you know, he's been able to uh, choose something different um, given his observations. Um, so quite important for us uh, for being able to do compositional reasoning is the idea that we can actually compare channels, these information theoretic um, mechanisms using a uh, ordering which uh, we call refinement and the way that the refinement is set up means that if we have this relationship between two channels C and D then uh, it means that in all possible scenarios defined by these gain functions and for all priors the information leaked through D is less than the information leaked through C. So that's where we can say, so if we have this relationship, and you can define it like that. Um, so we have this relationship, uh, uh, which we can define using matrix multiplication on the channels, um, but also uh, just by looking, defining it in terms of saying that in all scenarios, D really does leak less. So the average vulnerability uh, with D gives us some, a smaller value than with C. It means that D really is more secure. And that turns out to be a very robust relationship. Uh, so we'll be interested in that a lot for our compositional reasoning. So now let, uh, let's just go quite quickly uh, to illustrate all of those things on this little password example. So um, the secret is the password, the observations are the timings, and what does the adversary want to do? He wants to guess the password. So he's gonna be using a Bayes vulnerability thing on this password. So this is a traditional um, uh, information flow analysis of this thing is that we would actually create a channel from that program. So the uh, columns are labeled with observations. So those are the timings and the rows are labeled with possible secrets. So we're just making it simple. So secrets are just uh, some kind of integer. And you can see that this, if the adversary had a perfect measurement, he would be able to uh, figure out the initial value of the password perfectly. So that's why we have ones down this uh, diagonal. But that was a bit too boring. So I invented something else, which is slightly more interesting in terms of information flow. Suppose we have a second secret variable X, which we assign either the password or the password plus one, 50-50 either way. That's also going to be secret. And then we run that through the program. Now, what I've put here is I've put this something called a print x greater than zero. And when I come and show you the semantics of this programming language, that print statement is the way that we annotate um, information leaks in programs. So the idea is that we want to have a little programming language and we want to annotate it with saying we've got a leak here, we've got a leak here, we've got a leak here, and then we can actually um, have a look at it and analyze it using these, um, this information flow Bayesian update um, uh, posterior vulnerability kind of calculations. So here is the channel for this. Uh, so if it's, uh, let's have a look at it. So we've got halves everywhere now. Uh, oops, sorry. So, uh, so for each timing, therefore, the, for most cases, the adversary can't rule out exactly what the, um, uh, what the password is. So there's a bit of uncertainty there. Um, so, as I say, this is, we're going to use Bayes vulnerability, so that's the gain function. So now what are we going to do with this? So let's just assume that we have a uniform prior for this channel. Um, and so we stick it in, we calculate this hyper distribution, which is the thing on the right hand side. So in two cases, of course, on the extreme cases, then the adversary will be able to figure out exactly what uh, the uh, what PW is. So remember that this particular adversary wants to find out PW, doesn't really care about X, but he's going to be using this uh, timing 
uh, thing to do that. Uh, but in the middle cases, uh, he can't figure out exactly what the uh, secret is. So when we put all that together with Bayes vulnerability, we see that instead of being before this program was run, the adversary only knew the password up to there's four possible um, there's four possibilities, so it would be one quarter, but now it's gone up to five eighths. So this is quite a leaky uh, channel, nevertheless, a leaky program. So it was quite good for the adversary. All right, so. Um, Can I just interrupt for a minute, Annabelle, please? Yes. So somebody asked that uh, if X is being printed directly, is the adversary still somehow using the timing? Uh, so it wasn't X being printed directly, sorry. It was only whether X is greater than zero. So, I mean, this, uh, so this is a very kind of, uh, sort of, uh, it's a, like a brute force um, timing model. It's not really a timing model. You should, you should imagine executing this program and each time we go around the loop, we see Yes, X is greater than zero. Yes, X is greater than zero. So it's a sort of very poor man's way of modeling a timing attack. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so, so, the num so, so it's sort of like the number of times you see, yes, X is still greater than zero. You say, well, if I see just that printed out once, then my timing was one is that kind of that kind of thing so you know it's not actually with a stopwatch um, that's but that's the way that you should think of this all right so now um, okay so so yeah so we can work out the these things by hand obviously by um, just writing out the channel and doing stuff on pencil and paper. But, you know, we've got some much bigger examples that, and quite complicated examples that we want to look at. It's actually mostly the, comp the complexity of some of these um, information flow problems rather than the number of lines of code, nothing like that. It's the complexity that we're interested in. So um, together with uh, some colleagues, they um, have implemented this little tool uh, in Haskell, which uh, allows you more or less to, to write uh, sequential programs using all of the constructs that you want to do, and then annotating it with these print statements, which uh, are the way at the moment we are indicating that there is some information flow. So we'll see a little bit about that in a moment. But um, this is where we, we started to use, to find using uh, some category theory quite useful for modeling these kinds of things. And in particular, we wanted to give a, an, uh, an information flow aware semantics for, for these little programs, for, for this programming language. And then we wanted to study the actual programming language. So we're just using the probability monad. So I won't um, uh, talk about this a great deal because I guess it's extremely familiar to everyone. So we're just having D is the, the uh, type constructor to make distributions. Uh, so then we have the two natural transformations, one to make point distributions and one to make to compute averages. Um, so as I pointed out, these you can see the structures which are important for quantitative information flow already. So the uh, dx are the secret type and the d squared x are the these hyper distributions. So we have this nice, um, uh, it very nicely um, uh, makes this uh, structure which is important for actually uh, working out these um, uh, the result of information flow. Annabelle, is everything yeah. finite in this setting? Pardon? X is everything finite? X is finite, and these are finitely uh, supported. The, yes, for for this talk, yes, definitely. Okay. It, it it would get more interesting for continuous, but you know, 
It's late at night, so everything is finite. <laughs> Uh, all right. So now, uh, so so what we're going to do is we're going to um, model uh, programs uh, in this semantics as taking secrets and producing hyperdistributions. So it's really you think about taking a prior and it computes um, these hyperdistributions. So these distributions over posteriors is is the way that you should think of these things. Um, and also in this programming language, you should just think that all states are hidden from the adversary. So the adversary can't actually sort of look inside of the program and see what's happening there. But the, uh, so that the information available to the uh, adversary will happen through these print statements. So, uh, so you can see that what's happening is a, is a, a wee bit com more complicated than just channels because now we have updates. So what, what this model is actually going to be producing is an abstract version of hidden Markov models. Um, so here we have, um, so, so very quickly, this is how you sort of do it in the, once you decide to do this, it becomes sort of fairly obvious what you do. So uh, everything has got to be interpreted as something from dx to d squared x now. So you just take a Markov update, which is often just given as something which you give it a state in it, and then it gives you a dis probability distribution over um, you know, output states. Which So this is how you would interpret something like that assignment statement. And you do that in the normal way and hopefully all of that stuff is right. So you just do the push forward of F and then you do an average and then you, the final thing is that you create a, a point distribution which gives the right type um, for doing something like that. Um, now the print statement is a, is a bit more complicated. It was too complicated for me to write down. Um, but the way that you should think of it is that the, um, so the print statement takes an expression in the program variables, evaluates that expression at whatever state it is, and then you imagine that that becomes the observation, the value becomes the observation which is available for the uh, adversary. Um, so, but what really happens is that you take whatever um, a secret that you're working with and you make the hyper distribution um, you, you kind of make a channel from that, from that, um, uh, from those observations, and then you make the hyper distribution in the way that I described earlier. Uh, and then the final one, also very, everybody has seen this a thousand times probably. Just composition is you, if you have p followed by q, then you just do P and then you do the push forward of Q and then you um, average things. And that gives the, um, it takes all of the observations that you have from P and then you, it adds together all of the observations that you make from Q and then it sort of squashes everything up and it, what you end up is sort of like a digest of this is now the adversary's view of the current state of the system. And I should point out that this, I think I said earlier that this is, you know, effectively an abstract hidden Markov uh, model. Um, so states are changing. And so any kind of interrogation with, um, uh, any kind of interrogation now with, uh, um, with gain functions uh, applies it to the, to the actual final uh, values of the state. So um, I can see time is getting on. So uh, this is just to show you that actually we can do some nice things now. This is a very leaky secretary problem. We can run it through um, this little Kaufia tool and we can draw graphs like that. But what I really want to tell you about um, in this last uh, 10 minutes is we're really interested in properties of the language. And in particular, uh, I want to get back to where I started um, started from, which is talking about we really want to do compositional reasoning. 
Um, so here is would be an example of kind of like a, a compositional reasoning. If uh, we kind of want to think, have all of our constructs in the in the language to be monotone. So um, an example of that would be that if you have P and Q and you have P prime is more secure than P, then you'd want to have P followed by Q is uh, refined by P prime followed by Q. So that the refinement, um, the security properties um, are, are maintained through this refinement. So the first, um, so once you, once you have once you have this uh, idea of of a, like a, interpreting this programming language with information flow properties, we can actually start saying, well, what sort of um, what sort of uh, language constructs can we have if, for example, we want to have this this uh, this compositionality idea embedded in the language, and in particular, if we want to have a, a like a monotonicity law for certain um, constructs in the language. So in in many when, when you actually start looking at what people do, what often comes up is this thing called hidden choice. So we wonder then, can, is it possible to have a hidden choice which is able to be compositional? Because, because whatever we build, we want to be able to reason about it. So therefore, we're only going to allow constructs in our language where we have uh, such uh, composition, which allows us to reason compositionality. So one of the things we looked at like as a straw man is can we actually have a hidden choice um, construct in our language that would be compositional so um, what i hope to show you is that no you can't so what is a hidden choice well i've called it hidden if so if h and k are secret bits we would say um, we can branch according to the value of the secret bit h and the question is um, if it's hidden, then it would mean that the adversary can't see the evaluation of the if, but the adversary might be able to see, as in this example, observations from what happens depending on which way you branch. So, for example, in, in this example, if the hidden uh, variable is one, then what's printed out, so what's observed, is the exclusive or of, of these hidden things H and K. Otherwise, the adversary always sees one printed out. So now if hidden if as a construct in its own right can be made um, uh, monotone, that would mean that if we if we replaced any either of the branches with a program which was more secure, then the um, the more secure version should be overall more secure. But hidden if can't possibly have that uh, property. Why is that? Well, let's just have a look in terms of information flow. So if uh, we consider just the statement on its own, because after all, it is a first class citizen in our programming language, print the exclusive or of, of H and K. Well, that is always less secure than something which just prints a constant, because just printing a constant doesn't release any information at all. All right, so therefore, if hidden if could be uh, compositional, then the program at the top would be less secure than the program at the bottom, because print H, X, or K is less secure than print zero, because print zero doesn't do anything with the secret. But it turns out that if we work everything out using, um, we define what hidden if should be, i.e. it doesn't release any information, but its branches do, then um, you can actually implement such a thing in this uh, little program. And this is what it would print out in a hyper-distribution fashion. So the marginal, the one div four and the three div four are marginals and the posteriors on the inside are the posterior um, uh, uh, a representation of the posterior. So, for example, the uh, the things in brackets are the states of H and K. So, and the top program, so the one with the um, printing the XOR, 
it, uh, for example, with probability one quarter, the adversary think doing its Bayes, his Bayesian reasoning will figure out exactly what H and K is. Um, however, if we compare the top and the bottom, we see that the bottom program, which was supposed to be more secure, turns out actually to be perfect leaker of H. Okay, so when we see print zero, then we definitely know that H was zero. And if we print, see print one, then we see that H was definitely one. And after all, H and K are both supposed to be secrets in this program. So that's how, um, you know, once you have, um, once you start wanting to have a programming language, you can actually start saying, well, what are the nice um, constructs that you can have? And so hidden if is, is never a good idea. You should never branch uh, on high, which is, course you see that in um uh you know when people talk about this kind of thing but it was good to see it coming out in the um uh in the model so is compositional reasoning um at all possible so let's quickly go back to the timing attack and um and this is where we actually start wondering about uh, correlation so you can see in that previous example with hidden if the problem was that there were these correlations with these different types of secrets. So if we look at, go back to our program here, it, it, we can sort of come up with a little example like this. So we have our password and um, obviously that leaks something about the password, but now we can say, well, let's set the password to a uniform choice after we've done all of that leaking. So now uh, it seems like that we have actually protected the password because the adversary can't actually see what the final value of the password is. So all of that leaking stuff, you know, well, it took a while, but uh, it, hasn't ha it hasn't actually um, put PW at risk at all, because after all, we have uh, reset it, which is what we're forced to do every six months or so. But anyway, um, but now here's the problem. And this is this was the problem that we faced when we thought we really want to have a system where we want to be able to do compositional reasoning. Here is a new uh, secret, NPW. So sometimes people share their passwords uh, between different systems. So this would be an example of this. So we set NPW to the initial value of PW. We do its decrement and then we just set PW uniformly. So PW is now OK. The adversary doesn't know anything about what value that is. But what about NPW? Hasn't that timing attack leaked stuff about NPW? Well, yes, it has, because an inference combined with timing reveals a vulnerability to NPW. And so that's the problem. So, uh, so what we uh, wondered, so in standard uh, verification, you can reason perfectly well about standalone uh, pro uh, programs like this and then incorporate uh, what you what the properties of those things into properties of the whole system. There's no problem with that. But now with information flow, uh, there is a problem. So we want to be able to have uh, some kind of um, semantics where we can um, have a secure uh, have this refinement. So we can do some reasoning about prog prime maybe and figure out some sort of worst case security properties by um, looking at a simpler specification prog. And then we want to be able to lift those properties to context. So we can build complicated contexts with C and we want to be able to say, well, yes, those uh, security properties are still valid, the ones that we've worked out. And so this was where we um, figured out that actually what we need to do all along, if we want to do reasoning like that, where we have components which might not actually mention any other kinds of systems and we want to just do some small reasoning about those smaller components, we still want to be able to incorporate the information flow problems, uh, the information flow properties to system uh, wide properties. And so this very quickly summarizes this thing that we came up with, uh, which, which was basically we have to start by studying correlations in their own right. So just quickly, the category of correlations takes as object sets. Arrows are 
channel matrices which set up joint distributions between sets and then programs then become natural transformations um, uh, between uh, the, these functors which describe how to go from how to it how to incorporate a correlation between two things into a correlation between other things um, so that's uh, there is a paper and, and and but it needs a lot more study and um, hopefully I shall understand eventually more about category theory to um, prove some other more interesting things um, in this space so um, in conclusion, information flow is subtle. There's very curious um, things that uh, has curious consequences. But um, if you want to do compositional reasoning, which you know we do as verification people, then it seems like we really need some nice um, ways to think about uh, correlations as interesting things in their own right, um, so that we can incorporate it into um, our programming. Uh, language uh, so that we can uh, investigate and analyze small but complicated systems. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Annabelle. So I guess people who want to ask questions can unmute themselves and ask. If not, I will fire off the first uh, question. So I had a, uh, a bit of trouble at the end when the category of correlations appeared. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> because it seemed like an interesting mathematical structure, but I, I lost the thread that connected it to the actual semantics of the programming language. Yes. So can we just look at that slide again and try, yeah. and try down the yeah. component to programming yeah. language? Uh, Yes, yeah, sorry, it was um, ridiculously quick at the end. <laughs> so, so we have, um, yeah, so, so what, what we have here is, um, so the H's are, are the programs. And what we need to be able to do is we say, well, H just operates, let's say, on passwords or something. So those X's. But we have to kind of consider H maybe operating in, um, in a scenario where we've got these N NPW passwords. So that could be a Z1, right? So therefore this H Z1 is something which takes a password maybe correlated with some other password and, and then it produces something, you know, it changes its, um, it changes whatever thing it's, it's changing, but it's also carrying around this original relationship that it had with all of the things that it was correlated with. But the difficulty here is that H could actually change the value of X. And that's what makes it a little bit more complicated. If you just had programs that just released information like those channels, doing this is quite easy. And what's a bit tricky is that you sort of have to say, now I've changed things but I actually have to remember the original correlation that I had before. And that's what this is doing. It's right. a bit weird. Um, right. okay. and, and probably it's, a, it's some weird category that I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but, that's, but that's, that's kind of what you have to do in order to, actually writes thing, things down that make sense. Um, and it's quite hard to do if you don't have a nice language, which is why we actually got started getting interested in, in maybe using um, some categorical ideas and languages to sort of capture these things. So Alex Simpson has a question. 
Go ahead, Alex. So thank you for the, the very interesting talk. So actually, I didn't quite understand your answer to Prakash's question because I had a more basic question along, along the same lines, which was just, would you mind repeating a little bit more slowly the definition of the category? Of yes, yes. So, um, so the definition of the category is that the objects are just sets. So just think of them, well, everything is finite at the minute. So just think of them as finite sets. Mm -hmm. And then the morphisms um, between those finite sets are, you think of those as, as matrices of numbers. And those are, those are things where you're actually, that you think of those as setting up a, um, a joint distribution between two sets. So mm -hmm. that's what we call a correlation. <laughs> So can we can we just think of them as joint distributions? The model? Yes, yes, we can just think of them exactly as joint distributions between sets. So um, and, and then you, then, you compare yeah. marginalization on the the middle one or something. Uh, so what this H this H thing um, you can think of as. Um, it kind of so H in itself would be would be like the program that I showed you, which only has talks about X's, right? Okay. So it just it just has variables and it changes things and releases information just about X's. Okay, so could could right. you could you put a reference on Zulip and then so we can we can look it up? It says uh, like for a paper, you mean? Yeah, well, just somewhere we, we can find the definition written out. Um, ah, yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you don't need to do it now, but just... I'll, I'll oh, yes, yeah, so zoom it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, just a quick question, what is yeah. FKI? Pardon? What is FKI? Uh, so... Um, FKI is a, uh, I don't have the definition, uh, so FKI is a functor that maps uh, secrets X to the set of joint distributions between X and, um, and its, um, uh, its input. So I guess he's asking, uh, FK is a functor from where to where exactly? Yeah. So it, yeah. So it's a functor that map that uh, takes. Um, uh, so it. So it takes. Um, you know, one of these things, and it maps it to. Um, I suppose it uses the uh, the Z one and the Z uh, and the. It so, uses the channel arrow, so that's the arrow part. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, actually, I think it, I think all it does is it it takes a Z, which is going to be a, um, a an arrow between the Z one and the Z two. Yeah, that's it. So it takes it. So the Z is a joint distribution between Z one and Z two. And then it takes something of this type, which is again you can think of as a um, a joint distribution, which can be written out as a matrix. And then it changes the joint. Uh, so it, then it uses the correlation between Z one and Z two to create a correlation between X and Z two. And I think it just I think what all you have to do is just think of it as matrix multiplication. Yeah, I okay. think that's how it works. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we still have a couple of minutes left in case people want to ask further questions. So uh, I'm just checking. So if you do have a question, please just unmute yourself and ask. And if not, let me ask what's come becoming um, the canonical Prakash question. 
<laughs> which is, <clears throat> so this category uh, of correlations is measuring some kind of, of um, <clears throat> refinement property, right? It's used in the context of reasoning by refinement about, about uh, security properties. And right. I'm wondering, yes. I'm wondering, is there a role for a metric that talks about how much is being leaked in some quantitative mm -hmm. way? Or how yeah. close are two grams? Well, yes. So, um, so I mean, so the, the way that you, that, that we measure how m useful the information how much information can be usefully used is that comparison between the prior and the posterior, right? Right. So, um, so now, I mean, there's lots of people, they've built metrics of all different kinds because you've got distributions so that you can put a, you can, you can use all different kinds of metrics, but the, I mean, the ones that seem to be most relevant for, sort of security properties are, are these comparisons using the these vulnerability measures. So you mm -hmm. can make a metric out of those vulnerability measures. Um, or pseudo metrics or something. Um, okay. But I mean, what, really what you want to do is um, sometimes you want to give a, a, put a number on a channel, which basically says that over all possible um, uh, sort of scenarios, you know, a very small amount of information leaks. So, that you, so there's different ways uh, to do it, but you might want to actually have a metric that says if, if these things are very close, then something. But it, it's most usefully uh, got to give you something in the way that you can interpret it. There's maybe number of bits mm -hmm. you know, leaking or the time it takes to find yeah, out of the speech or something like that. So something meaningful in, in information flow. Yeah. So I think Tobias had a question. Please fire, go ahead, Tobias. Yeah. Um Maybe you can say a little bit more about what do you then do with this category of correlations? And in particular, do you have uh, generalizations of all the things from the previous part of the talk or maybe aiming, are you, <clears throat> are you aiming for that? Well, well, yes, so we are aiming for that. So all we have done, well, so we had one big problem, which was, do we really need to do verification where we look at, where we have to consider all possible um context and that's we didn't want to do that because that's like that's too much work you want to be able to 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 have verification which is you know efficient um so there was there was actually just one property that we wanted to have which was what's the what it what is the what is the context the only context that you need to do the analysis in which then generalizes to everything else and the context, not surprisingly, but we just wanted to have a proof of it, is that you, have, you actually have to take the correlation, which essentially preserves the correlation between the initial state and the final state. And once you have that, then you can get everything. And using these kinds of things, we can show it. So that was the main sort of practical thing that we wanted to have. But then it's kind of like, well, you know, we should be talking about correlations because that seems to be fundamental. And I'm pretty sure that there's lots of other properties and I would like to at some point get around to looking at it, but we just haven't had time to, to do that. But yes, I think, I think um, generalizations, nice properties and things like that. Um, we haven't done that, not because we don't want to, it's because we just haven't had time yet. Okay, thanks very much. So uh, let's all give another round of applause to Annabelle. Uh, and thank you very much.